Okay, now we get to our second reading uh, from the letter of St. James. So just a reminder, James, we're, we're in this for five weeks in a row from the letter of James. It's so good. He's very direct, and I'm going to read. So I'm going to read a reading, but then I also want to um, keep on reading, actually. Um, it's really strong. Now, I take it back. I'll read the reading, and then I'll go on to talk further about, later on, I'll read the rest of a of, uh, particular section that I want to read. So James chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. My brothers and sisters, show no partiality as you adhere to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if a man with gold rings and fine clothes come, comes into your assembly, and a poor person in shabby clothes also comes in, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say, Sit here, please, while you say to the poor one, Stand there, or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil designs? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, did not God choose those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love, who love him? Okay, really good. James is very direct, and it's actually so that the part that I'm going to read later is actually more direct because um, we basically just cut James off like mid-paragraph, and, um, and I understand, I totally understand why we did because it's, it, he gets really strong, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that part. Uh, just because he's strong doesn't mean we shouldn't read it and shouldn't be familiar with it. So anyway, so what, what's the deal? So if you remember last week, <clears throat> we started with James chapter 1, and we just read a few little uh, little little excerpts from, from chapter 1. Really good. We talked about the goodness of God and how God gives everything and how we need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So that's, that's actually a really important point that we heard last week, that, that it, when we hear the word of God, we need to actually let it change us to the point that we live it out. Not just to hear, but, but actually to live. And if we only hear and don't live, if we're not doers of the word, then we are only deceiving ourselves. We, we're convincing ourselves that we're, we're actually in a good place with God when the reality is, is that we're not. Uh, and that's, that's a big thing, that Jesus actually expects that the word of God would change us that his teaching would change us, that his death would change us, that his sacraments would change us. He expects that to be the case because to be one of his disciples is to live like him. And a big part of his ministry is calling to repentance all of those who want to follow after him. Why? Because, because of sinful humanity, sinful human nature, we don't live like God. And so he comes to call us to turn from living not like God to living like God. That's what he calls us to do. And so there needs to be a real change, not only in what we hear, but a real change in what we do. That's really big. And so we finished last week with verse 21, where he says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So those two things, which which ultimately I suppose could be boiled down, and I mentioned this last week, could be boiled down to love your neighbor as yourself and to love God to keep yourself unstained from the world. So to care for your soul in such a way that it allows you to love God more purely, to worship him more perfectly, but then also to care for widows and orphans, those who are in need, in a real need in, 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 uh, in your area. So that doesn't, it's not limited to widows and orphans, but it's just like, this is an example of someone that you, you ought to care for is those who are in desperate need, which of course we can already start to see the connection between our first reading and our gospel, especially our gospel passage. What happens? These people bring someone to Jesus and who is it they, they bring to Jesus? They bring this man who is, who is deaf and mute, um, who's got a speech impediment. So someone who is in desperate need of the Lord is brought to the Lord by the people around him. Which, again, is a fascinating thing that, that at the time of Jesus, it is the Gentiles, uh, at least in this particular case, it is the Gentiles who catch the message of the gospel more than, than the non-Gentiles, more than the people of God catch it in this particular instance. So, so anyway, so that leads James into the next session where he says, show no partiality as you adhere to the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? Show no, don't, don't show favor um, to, to one or the other. And I suppose there's, there's the opposite. This, this could work, um, and maybe I'll mention that. But, but I, th I think our natural tendency is to, to follow the, the pattern that James lays out for us when, when he says, um, what, well, if a man in gold rings, with gold rings and fine clothes, comes into your assembly, that is into your synagogue, into your, your time of, of prayer, of, of worship, if a man comes into there and a poor person in shabby clothes comes in, you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here, please. While saying to the other one, yeah, go sit over there or sit at my feet. Stand over there. So that's what James is talking about. He's like, look, don't, don't you dare show favor to those who are wealthy over those who are shabby, those who are poor. That is, that is a big problem when we do this. And unfortunately, like you can think of maybe some examples in our, our current church culture where we still do this, actually. We, we show favor to those who are wealthy. Why? Because 
well, their wealth can help our ministry better, maybe, you know, that, through their providence. And it's not to say that we shouldn't ask them for their, their assistance and that we shouldn't be grateful for their assistance. But if we're showing favor by giving them uh, greater honors, by giving them greater seats uh, in this in a synagogue or, or it, at, at, at banquets or something like that, then James, is, look, he might have some strong words for us. Um, so anyway, so this is where he says, like, okay, well, here's the deal. When, when you do this, you've made distinctions among yourselves and you have made yourselves judges with evil designs. This, I, was, I was struck by this as I was reading because if you remember last week's gospel, Jesus talks about things that defile a person. And the very first thing that he talked about defiling a person are evil thoughts. Uh, another way to translate that word thoughts is designs or, or uh, voluntary thoughts. So when James is saying that you have evil designs, he's, he's ultimately saying like you've become defiled inside of you. And that's, that's not good news because he says, look, listen, listen, listen. Did, you, did not God choose those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? What is it that we're, like, what are the riches that we're looking for? We're looking for those who are rich in faith. Those, like the people like the Syrophoenician woman who comes to Jesus in her poverty and Jesus seems to push her away when, when, when what? As a result of this, she's like, no, I'm not leaving because I'm rich in faith and my, my faith leads me to you. This is where the wealth of my faith leads me. Uh, and, and similarly, those friends of this man who was deaf and blind, uh, uh, deaf, and, deaf and mute, um, their, their, their wealth of faith in Jesus it leads them to bring this guy to Jesus so that he can heal them. Right? Did God not choose those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? And, and this isn't to say that rich people can't enter the kingdom. That's not to say that at all. At the same time, Jesus does say that it is difficult for people who are wealthy to enter the kingdom. He talks about this. He says, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. And this is, this is a, a striking thing. You know, I think, I think about this in my own life. It's like, okay, well, I, I don't have a lot of money, but I have more money than I need. And, and so there, there can be a temptation, just like for anyone who has more money than they need, there can be a temptation to just like lean on that, to lean on my resources, to lean on, on whatever. Like if it seems like I'm praying and nothing is happening, well, I, I guess I can just lean on my resources. And, and, uh, and again, the, the point here is not, is not to say that if, I, if you're rich, you're in a terrible spot. But the point that James is trying to make is like, there, there must have been a something happening where people were showing greater favor to those who had wealth and lesser favor to those who were poor. When the reality of the gospel is that we are to treat each other equally, if not even to have a greater love, a preference for the poor. In fact, we, the church talks about this, a preferential love for the poor. But so that's, that's strong enough as it is. But James keeps going. And I just want to read uh, the next few verses, verses 6 through 13, where he says, But you dishonored the poor person. Are not the rich oppressing you? Do they themselves not haul you off to court? Is it not they who blaspheme the, the noble name that was invoked over you? However, if you fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but falls short in one particular has become guilty in respect to all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not kill. Even if you do not, do not commit adultery but kill, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as people who will be judged by the law of freedom. For the judgment is merciless to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So what, what's... what's James getting at here. Well, first he's, he's pointing out like, okay, you're dishonoring the poor person when the reality is, is what? That the wealthy dishonor you. And, and this is, again, this is not across the board. So I have to make all these nuances because I'm sure that there are people who are sensitive about these, these kinds of things. And so whatever, but like, let's, let's read the word of God. So it must've been the case at the time that the wealthy were oppressing the Christians. And yet when the wealthy come into the Christian synagogues, the Christians are going out of their way to like, to, to, Pull out all the stops to care for the wealthy. When it's like, no, these are the very people that are that are causing you problems. When, when the reality is like, don't dishonor the poor person. Why? Because well, Jesus himself was poor. Second Corinthians chapter eight verse nine says, "You know the the love of Jesus Christ. For for although he was rich, he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Rich how? Rich in faith." Like, so this is, this is the reality. And if we transgress the law by showing partiality or by breaking any of the, the commandments, even though we're, we're faithful in all of the other ones, James is saying, we're, we're still guilty of all of that. And so we need to live and act as though we, we know that we're going to be judged by this law. 
And that might seem harsh because maybe we don't talk about judgment enough in the church today, but, but this is the reality at play anyway. And so when, when James gets very direct and very, very strong, um, I think we need to take him seriously, at least in part or, or maybe entirely because this is the divinely inspired word of God. I mentioned last week that the letter of James, I think I mentioned this, um, we're going to see it more clearly next week, but the letter of James was a difficulty for the Protestant re- reformers, for Martin Luther. He wanted to, he wanted to take, James, take James out of the Bible. He didn't take him out of the Bible, but he wanted to. He saw James as like a secondary level of scripture as opposed to, you know, the more true scripture that, that aligned with whatever he wanted it to align with. Um, it's difficult. And why is it difficult? It's difficult because it demands action. It demands that we that we go to work for the kingdom. Not that our work is what saves us in a, in a, in a sense, it, and yet it's, it's that our work participates in our salvation. Um, and so we, we, need to, we need to actually put into action the gospel as it has been received, as it has been given by Jesus through the apostles. Um, strong, absolutely. Let yourself be uncomfortable with it. This is, this is the thing. We have to let ourselves be uncomfortable, my, myself included. And if we need to repent, we need to repent. And if we need to grow, we need to say, okay, Lord, I need your help to grow. I need you to help me love the poor. I need you to help me not be overly concerned about the wealthy. I need you, I need you to help me, Jesus, to fully embrace your gospel. Whew, gosh. Okay, so we obviously got further than our reading wanted us to get, but I just, I thought that was just an important thing for us to get into. And so anyway, it was good. I love this Bible study. You know, I say this every week. It's just so good. So thanks for thanks for sharing it with me. And to be honest with you, even if you weren't here, I'd be doing it anyway. So um, I'm glad you are here. I'm glad that we can share in this together, actually, um, that you're not unimportant to me, actually. I, I really appreciate it. I'm encouraged by people who watch this, who, who participate in it. Absolutely. Um, the, the word of God is good. It is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword. So let's continue to allow the word of God to pierce us, to pierce us. Uh, in a real way and to change us, to transform us into real disciples, radical disciples maybe of Jesus Christ. I'll look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you. Peace.